Right, uh, you're right, welcome back. So we were looking at some of the background information on the first of our villains, that is Richard III. Um, this is an actor you might recognise called Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, he plays things like Sherlock uh, on TV. I think he's been in a couple of the Marvel films uh, and so on, and X-Men. Okay, and this is what we call the opening soliloquy to the play. A soliloquy, as I've said, is when you've got a character talking to the audience. And because of his talking to the audience, we get a real idea about what's going on in his mind and his motivations. Now, I know that Miss Panu has put a copy of this opening soliloquy on the system. So what might be an idea, rather than just actually watching this, and it's not absolutely complete, they've abridged it, they've taken a few lines from it, but nonetheless, what I'd recommend you do is, either on a computer, or probably better, so you can make a few notes on it as we go along, is print off a copy of the soliloquy. It's only about one page long, okay, which sounds a lot, but it's really not when it comes to actually Shakespearean speeches. Um, print off a copy of that, and so you can make some notes on it as we go along. Okay. After this, I'm going to go in and actually analyse that with you, so you get a real understanding of what Shakespeare's meaning is, and what Richard's motivations are. Okay, just have a watch of this. See his hunchback there.
let's have a look in a little bit more detail exactly what is meant by that. Okay. So, like I said, um, I'm going to go through this and take you through it. I'll make sure that these slides are on the system, but you should be working. I'll put a little icon there. You can be annotating this as you go along. And what I'll put in here is actually sort of little illustrations and things like that so you can understand exactly what's going. We'll probably do one section at a time. There are three sections to the soliloquy. And in this first one, which I'll just quickly read again to you now, because there's a little bit missed out of that Benedict Cumberbatch version. He says, Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the sun of York, and all the clouds that loud upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious reeds, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim village dwarf hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barred steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in the lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasings of a loot. Okay? Now, essentially, what is Richard saying here? Richard is telling us how he feels about war and how he feels about peace. Now, if we go back to our little points on context, I said that this is marking the end of that civil war between the Lancastrians and the Yorkists, the Wars of the Roses. So now we have embarked on a time of peace, and Richard's older brother, Edward IV, seemingly has won the final battle of the Wars of the Roses. They're a period of peacetime. Richard does not like peace. Richard likes war, because when there's war going on, there's opportunities for him to actually get what he wants. Okay? Now, one of the things that I did say was about Shakespeare exploring people who are people of action, the doers, and those people who are the thinkers. Now, you might actually get from the very first word of this play what type of person Richard III is. At this point, he's still Richard, Duke of Gloucester. He's not king yet. Okay, he's still got those four people to get by to become king. Okay, and he's starting off with now. Now, that is a really aggressive way of starting a play. He comes onto the stage, probably in Elizabethan times, the boos and hisses. Remember what I said he was more like a Hitler character in the context of when this play was released. Okay, the greatest enemy, if you like, to the current Queen's grandfather. And he comes onto the stage and everyone's hissing and booing and jeering and he addresses the audience and says, now. Okay? So the first thing we can say about this is, not only is that an aggressive opening, but that tells us that he is a man of action. Now I'm going to do something. I'm not going to put it off. I'm not going to wait. It's going to be now. We need to act now. Now is the winter of our discontent. Now, quick look at this pronoun, our. In the context of when a royal person speaks, they often speak collectively. And by that I mean the current queen would say we, meaning I. Okay? So when Richard said now is the winter of our discontent, it means mine. It means his own. Okay? What does discontent mean? Well, if you are contented, it means you are, and of course, you can engage with this at home, you probably might know it. If you are contented, you are happy. You're satisfied with what's going on. If Richard is discontented, it means he is unhappy. Okay? His unhappiness is represented by the word winter. Okay? Now we call that in English when
right? When the weather somehow represents a mood, okay, that Richard feels unhappy. It is winter time for Richard. It's cold and unpleasant for Richard. Why? Because it's peace. And he hates peace. Okay? May glorious summer. That is peace time. And you can imagine, if we've just had all these decades of war and so on, and the war is suddenly over, just like when what we're going through at the moment is over, it'll feel like summertime. It'll feel sunny and warm, and everyone will be happy, and there'll be parties, and so on. This is pathetic fallacy. Okay, so peacetime is summer for everybody else. For Richard, peacetime is winter. He hates it. Okay? And who has made it peace? Who has brought the end to the Wars of the Roses? The son of York. Now remember what family I said Richard and Edward were all part of. They were the Yorkists. Okay? They are the Yorkist family. The son of York, this is a word we call a homophone, where we spell a word differently, but it sounds the same. So if I was to make that an O rather than a U, okay, the son of York is Edward IV. Okay? But the reason why Shakespeare puts it as the sun is because the king, the symbol for kingship, is the sun. Okay, at the centre, that's why a crown is shaped the way that it is. Okay, it's meant to look like the sun. And from Edward IV, from the king, the king who's been put there by divine right, okay, the rest of the country bathes in his warmth for peacetime. Okay? But who's made it peacetime? Edward IV, the son of York. Okay? Now this is quite a strange image. And all the clouds that loud upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. If you can imagine, we go back to this idea of what we call pathetic fallacy, where the weather represents the mood. If you imagine loads of clouds, okay, they have been over England for so long, okay, they've been oppressing England, weighing down in England, that's been war. But now it's peacetime, those clouds are no longer up in the sky, they're in the deepest part of the ocean, okay, so they're buried right underneath the ocean, away from people. Okay, so they don't have to worry about those clouds anymore. Now this is where we get some ideas about how Richard feels about war. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths. Peacetime. They've won the battles. They've won the war. And if you think of what a wreath was, okay, if you've ever seen pictures of sort of Roman soldiers and tribunes when they've won battle, they would put a wreath, okay, around the back of their heads. And actually they'd ride into Rome on a chariot and someone would hold that wreath over their head as a sign of victory. And he's saying now, the House of York, we've all got these wreaths, these victorious wreaths around our brows, around our head. And we're sort of congratulating ourselves, we're patting ourselves on the back and saying, good job, well done. Okay? He's saying, our bruised arms hung up for monuments. Now remember what I said, Richard hates peace, he loves war. The word arms here does not mean his limbs, these, okay? Arms is another word for weapons. And you should know what the word personification is. When we personify something, we give something which is an inanimate object, and we give it living characteristics. In this case, the word bruised. The weapons are bruised. They've been used a lot. They've been dented and they've been used to hit armour and so on. So the arms, the weapons are bruised. But they're not being used for war anymore. What are they being used for? They're being hung up for monuments. And it's a bit like if he's got his sword. Rather than that being used to go and kill people on the battlefield, they've been put up on the wall as decorations, okay? So our bruised arms are hung up for monuments. 
our stern alarms change to merry meetings. An alarm is the sound of battle. And again, it's been personified. Stern, serious sounds of battle. Okay? But instead of that sound being the prevailing sound, merry meetings. Instead of the sounds of battle, it's the sounds of parties. Now think about Richard III. Think about the fact that he is deformed. Think about the fact, yes, he's attractive in one way, but physically he's not very attractive. A man like that, who's a good soldier, who is brave, is he going to enjoy fighting on the battlefield at a time of opportunity, maybe even to get himself a throne, or is he going to enjoy going to a party? He's always going to enjoy the former. He's always going to enjoy fighting on the battlefield. So those sounds of battle, the stern alarms, have changed to the sounds of parties, and he doesn't like it. Our dreadful marches to delightful measures. And imagine that, being in a medieval battle and seeing that army in front of you and the sound of the marching, filling the enemy full of dread. Dreadful, full of dread. And so the enemy had that army is marching towards and the sounds of those boots on the uh, turf and all that would fill them with dread, would fill them with fear. But it is an image to do with feet. People, men's feet aren't being used now to march into battle. Instead, they are delightful measures, which is dancing. And Richard is not shaped for dancing. Richard is not shaped for good parties and things like that because he's not particularly attractive and he's not particularly coordinated in that way. He's a soldier, he's a fighter. So he doesn't like the fact that weapons are now being hung up for decorations. He doesn't like the fact that the sounds of battle have been changed to the sounds of parties. And he doesn't like the fact that those marching into battle, men's feet, are now being used to do delightful dances. It's not him. And then we come to this image. Grim visaged war had smoothed his wrinkled front. Now, if you imagine war being personified again, war having a face, you probably can imagine it's not going to be a face which is smiling. It's more likely to be a face which is angry. Okay, it's more likely to be a face which is aggressive. Okay? That's all wrinkled up, snarling away. That's what the face of war. And that the visage is another word for a face. So the face of war, I would imagine, would be one which would be grim, which would be aggressive, and all of that. But now war has smoothed his wrinkled front. War is not angry anymore, and its face all contorted in battle. War has smoothed his wrinkled front. He's relaxed. Richard doesn't like that. He liked war to be aggressive. But look how many times there's lots of repetition in here. Why is there repetition in here? Because it's Richard saying again and again and again, now. This is what's going to happen. He is that man of action. Now is the winter of our discontent. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths. And now. Instead of mounting, it should say barbed, sorry, barbed steed. A barb, if you think of barbed wire, metal hooks. A steed is a horse. So men, now instead of getting on horseback with their horses all in armour and things like that, what are the men doing? Now instead of mounting barbed steeds going into battle to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, your adversary is your enemy, it would have been absolutely terrifying to see this battle horse with a man in armour charging towards you. Okay? What is men doing? What is man using his aggression for in peacetime? Not to go into battle, not to march, not to make the sounds of battle, not to charge an enemy, but he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. Now, the men are using all their aggression to flirt with the ladies, to actually go to these parties and listen to music and dance to it. And Richard isn't designed for that, okay? He hates it. So in this section here, it should be about your understanding 
Richard hates peace. Richard loves war. Richard wants to make things happen. And we've got lots of images in here about how it has changed for him. How he hates actually the things that men are actually doing now, rather than fighting in battle, and hacking each other up with swords and axes and things like that, and charging each other with their horses. Now it's peacetime. Now it's about parties. It's about dancing. It's about hanging up your weapons. It's about men doing other things to get rid of their aggression rather than fighting in war. Okay? It gives us a good impression of what Richard is like. It doesn't necessarily mean you should like this character because he is warlike, because he likes fighting. But it does tell us something about him. And we might admire him just a little bit for being the type of man who says, this is what I want, and I'm going to get it. Okay? All right. Move on to the next bit. Just wipe that down. Obviously, you can pause it, you can rewind stuff and so on. Let's see where we're All the time that we're doing this, you can be making your judgment on how you feel about the character, because ultimately, that's what it's all about. Okay, and I know that, uh, as I said, Miss Panu and Miss Mustafa will be making worksheets to complement this. But that is just a quick sort of, for the first part of the soliloquy at least, to give you a bit of understanding what it's all about. Okay. Now, this is the second section. The first section is how he feels about war. The second section is about how he feels about himself. All right? But I, I don't feel happy, it's peace. This is not summer for me, this is winter. Everybody else is happy and partying, but I. Marks him out as different. It is also very much about Richard. The repetition we have in this section of the soliloquy is all about the I, it's about me. It's very much the individual. This is the furrow that I am going to cut, and this is what I'm going to do. Okay? Now, this is all what we mean in terms of this word here euphemism. The euphemism is a nice way or a different way of saying something. Now Richard is deformed. Richard has his hunchback. He has his withered arm. He is not shaped, shaped, sculpted in such a way to make him attractive at parties. And all of this section is about how he feels and him describing his deformity. But I, that I'm not shaped for sportive tricks. Now remember the line that's just come before it, the lascivious pleasings of a lute. These men who are scampering around going to ladies' chambers, where they shouldn't be. A ladies' chamber is a private area just for ladies. These men are going in there and they shouldn't be doing it. So he says that I'm not shaped for sportive tricks. I'm not sporty, but sometimes that sort of sportive there is meaning other things as well, which he cannot do. I'm not shaped for sportive tricks, nor, differently going, made to court an amorous looking glass. Now a looking glass is an old, Word, you can imagine, for not a tennis racket, but a mirror. Okay? So when Richard looks in a mirror, and this word amorous means attractive, he looks in the mirror and he knows the reflection which he will see will be an ugly one. I am not made to court an amorous looking glass. I look in it, I see my reflection, and my reflection is ugly. I that am rudely stamped. He literally sees his body as having been stamped on. Okay? Now, if you know anything about medieval history, the stamp that somebody would use, okay, would be, let's see if I've got a picture of it for you. Yeah. Okay. The stamp would actually, you had to be a bit of wax, and every time they wrote a letter or did a... Uh, uh, document, they'd drip a bit of wax onto it to seal it, and they'd have a ring or a stamp, and they would put it on it, so they knew that it was from that person that hadn't been opened. 
And Richard's stamp, Richard's emblem, is this one, a boar, a wild boar. Again, not a particularly attractive looking animal. If you think about the animal that represents the English king, it's a lion, a unicorn, okay? Not a boar, okay? A pig with tusks, essentially. So he says, I'm rudely stamped. The image, the thing that represents me, is ugly, just like my reflection is ugly. But this is where we might feel quite sorry for him. Because remember I said, the thing about Shakespeare's characters is they might be villainous, but they've got heroic elements. They've got elements at least that we might find a bit attractive. He is brave. He goes for what he wants. And he wants love's majesty. He would love to be in love with somebody. He would love to be attractive to a woman. He would love to have someone wanting to marry him and all of that. But he cannot. I want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. But no one finds me attractive enough. So do we feel a little bit of sympathy for him there? And an understanding of why he does what he does. And this is what Shakespeare is all about. Remember I said right at the beginning, this is about people. Ambition is ambition. Jealousy is jealousy. Love is love. And he wants to be loved. But because he can't be, he's angry. And that's understandable. That is part of being 